must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Well, Steve, thanks so much again for joining me again today. Um, I know if you're listening out there, you're probably like, what do you mean by that? Well, this is actually our take two at recording this because uh, our first time trialing this, we had a little bit of some technical network errors that ended up happening there. But So, Steve, thank you again for all your tremendous work. I know you've done a lot throughout you know, research, teaching, and you've been involved with a lot with physiotherapy. But... You know, I recognize, and I'm always interested because everyone, it seems like everyone's journey into research, academia is always a little bit different. So I kind of like to dive in first before we get into the topic of research and kind of just figuring out what was that story that kind of got you to where you are today, basically? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me along. Um, yeah, so I, I actually came to physiotherapy a bit late, so I uh, did my bachelor degree as a mature age student so I was the weird old dude wandering around campus um, during that time um, uh, while I was doing my bachelor I also had the opportunity to work casually as a research assistant with Chris Mars group so Chris is a uh, he's done a lot of research in back pain and that group was really just starting at that point in time so um, I was lucky enough to get a, a bit of a taste of that through that um, so anyway, I did a bit of that and finished um, my degree. I went out and worked in private practice um, for a period of time. Um, I worked full time, not for that long, but over a year or so. Um, uh, but I don't know, there was always something nagging away at me, I guess, while I was treating patients. And um, it, it, you know, it, it may have just been that I wasn't very good at it. Um, but um, ultimately, it sort of raised more questions than it, than it answered for me, and and so I guess I, I found myself in this this state of being a little bit uncomfortable about it all. Any in any case, I uh, had the opportunity um, with the same group um, to come back and do a PhD, uh, which I did. So went back, uh, and so during the the three years or so, or three and a half years or so of my PhD, I treated patients part time during that, and and worked full time on my PhD. Um, so and that went well. I went. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a, a fantastic atmosphere. It was a great group of of people at, at sort of different levels. Some of us sort of starting out, um, others a little bit further along the, the journey. Um, the really stimulating environment. It was lots of questions and lots of discussions and about all sorts of things. And um, I, I just loved it, you know. And I loved the idea of having a job where your job is to ask questions. Um, and you know, it's fantastic. And it, fits well for me. Um, uh, after that period, I was fortunate enough to get a, a fellowship uh, to do a postdoc over in Amsterdam. So I spent three years there at, the, at a university there. Um, again, just continuing the research. Then I came back about five years ago. Um, again, fortunate enough to get another fellowship. And, and so that's sort of brought me up to here. I guess what's really changed in the last four or five years since I've come back to Australia is I've, I've started working with a guy called Chris Williams. Um, he also did his PhD at the same group a little bit after I did, but he now works in a um, for the health service uh, in a, a city about two hours north of Sydney. Um, but he works in the public health system in the population health unit, and and I guess what we've really found together is is uh, that a, a sort of real blend of perspectives whereby we've we've come with this from this clinical background or a, a background of treating patients and 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 research into patients. And there's where he's working at the moment. They're very much um, their their job is delivering 
um, health interventions, preventative interventions, essentially to the population, um, and 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 so that's I think offered us a really nice um, uh, different perspective on on what we do, and 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 opened up a lot of questions. So we can think about things from the clinical aspect, how to how to what goes on in the you know day to day life sort of population health space. How can that help, or how can that be blended with what we do? What happens in the clinic? Similarly, what about you know the people who are out in the general community who have the sorts of conditions that we see in the clinic? How does how does that interact with the, the more public health interventions and so on? So um, that's yeah, opened up sort of a, a more or less endless list of questions and and lots of stimulating discussions and so on. So it's been good. Well, that's great, and I really like how with that initiative that really strikes a good balance between having a clinical site, but then also doing research on top of that. So you're really trying to find research that to really just see how does this apply to the population level, you know, to help those clinicians. And, you know, understanding that I know that there's, you know, with you having your PhD, with you doing a lot of research throughout your experience thus far, um, I know there's been discussion on numerous kind of big pressing issues and not just physiotherapy research, but kind of just academic and higher level research in general. Um, you know, yeah. including but not limited to, of course, p-value manipulation, predatory journals, and I'm sure the list goes on and on. You know way more about that than I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but what do you think are the biggest, like most pressing issues regarding research, or regarding some of those? And what do you think are some of the best ways to actually address some of those issues? If, if I could just start a little bit more broadly in answering that question, and I hope to get to, to where, you, where you want to. Um, but, but in the first instance, I think that, you know, there's, and this, there's, there's this idea of what physiotherapy research is. Um, and and as, a, as a researcher, I think there's, there's some danger in attaching a profession to your research. So, so what I would like to think of myself in, in, in terms of my research identity is as a healthcare researcher. So what that does is that, is that my research, uh, this at, at the centre of my research is what happens to patients who have clinical conditions or in the, in the population health space are at risk of certain, you know, poor health, essentially. The problem with closely identifying your research with a profession is that then you run into problems if your research shows what your profession does doesn't work and then you set up a you, you have this sort of potential for a bit of an identity crisis <laughs> um and so and so i guess that's that's the first thing and 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 i think as physiotherapy ph- physiotherapists as as clinicians we should be looking beyond what we some idea of what we think the physiotherapy literature is um so the the person the person that we're treating in front of us they should have access to whatever is the best care for them that may or may not be within the remit of physiotherapy um, but so that what that means is it's a job of an evidence-based clinician in whatever profession to understand something broader than just the research in their own profession so so I guess that's that's a, a, a small part of the background so as I regards as, as so, so I guess I'd prefer to talk about healthcare literature um, and 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 uh, literature which so it's literature which is relevant to the sorts of patients that physiotherapists see okay so as opposed to physiotherapy research um, so in any case so so with that in mind um, what are some of the issues well the first and most obvious issue is that there's a lot of it all right so there's millions of papers on PubMed um, you know on the on Pedro on the physiotherapy evidence data, database just RCTs and systematic reviews there's 40 something thousand of them so there's a lot and so so what what that means is that efficient searching skills are critical because there's no way to, to keep up with 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 what's coming so so that means that the capacity the ability of of clinicians or people who want to use that research to, to find what's relevant to them and what's good is critical and that's a really really important skill that everyone needs to have the second part of that problem is a decent chunk of that is not very good right so there's a lot of research out there there is no that is no good and and it might be no good because the question isn't relevant or not well specified and it might need or or and or it might be no good because the methods used don't answer the question or can't answer the question um, so it, what that speaks to is the second skill that people who want to use research really need, which is the capacity to to appraise um, to appraise research. So to pick up a study and go, all right, here's the question: Is it relevant 
to 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 my question to what I want to know. Um, and secondly, have other methods they use? Do, does the methods they use give me confidence in whatever it is that they've found or concluded? Um, and so that those those two sets of skills are really really critical. Um, and I think what that does, the, the, the second part of those skills, that appraisal, it, it really means that clinicians need to know something about research methods. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know whether I don't know whether it's the same in your experience in in training to be a physiotherapist, but certainly in mine, and I suspect it's fairly common, is that you get um, all your anatomy, you get all your your basic psychology, you get um, your treatment parts. And then over here somewhere, you have research methods or evidence-based practice as a separate bit. Um, the problem then is people are not going to do a physiotherapy degree to learn about research methods. And so research methods and evidence-based practice is something to be endured before you can then go back and learn how to rub patients or move them or give them exercises or diagnose them or, or understand anatomy or physiology or whatever it is. Um, and so I, I think that's that's a real basic problem that we have that clinicians or the trained people training to, to, to be clinicians have this idea that research is something separate to, to what they do. Um, if they want to be a researcher, then they can learn about all that sort of stuff and people like me can learn about it and know about it and all that sort of thing. But the way I see it is 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 actually understanding something about those methods and they don't have to understand it to the sort of sophistication that it's important for me to. But if they don't understand that, then they can't do evidence-based practice it's 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 not possible it's not possible to to practice within this paradigm which we're all expected to pro to, to practice within if we don't understand research methods um, because we can't appraise we can't we can't an appraisal is nothing other than having a paper in front of you and determining how confident you are that what they say is something approaching the truth it's all it is right. um and and so so with regard to p-value manipulation and, and all these sort of methodological issues which are are around in the literature, yeah, yeah, they're around, but most of them are not that hard to spot if you know a little bit about methods. Um, and, and so that, that just becomes part of a bigger picture of, of, um, of, of working within an evidence-based practice paradigm. Yeah, I think you brought up so many important points on that. And I know that that's, I mean, there's many ways we could dive into that. But, you know, I kind of want to actually switch gears a little bit, because I'm really curious kind of to gather what it's like for you doing research in an academic system. Because yep. from what I've heard, at least, again, from the outside, I'm not involved in it, but I've heard that there are some definitely some strengths and limitations of research within academia due to incentivizing and certain constraints. Um, but to give a little context, and I'm not trying to say this is all programs, it's just something I've kind of heard, knowing that, you know, you guys with re you guys in academia have a lot of other duties to do on top of research and teaching, mm -hmm. but what yep. are the systemic constraints that it put that academia puts on you when it comes to conducting and publishing high quality research in today's day and age? So you're dead right in that there are perverse incentives in, I guess, in the system that we work within. And that, that is also the case within clinical practice. It's also the case in any job. But what are some of those? So, so probably most obviously is that there is a pressure on output. Okay, and So output is producing papers, talking, giving lectures. Um, it's, it's about getting grant funding, this sort of stuff. So that, that's, that's, they're the, the sorts of metrics by which um, – researchers have been um, judged and, and still are to some extent. There's a little bit of a shift which is going on at the moment, which is, I think is a good thing. But that essentially, is, so that if I'm thinking about what are the constraints to doing good quality research and doing the best research possible, you know, that's one of them. The, the, the reality is doing doing the big trials and and, 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 and big cohort studies, which which can be really influential in, in, in terms of, of um uh, of, of guiding practice takes a really long time. You know, if you're if you're talking about, you know, uh, um, I, I can talk about one of the the um, uh, RCTs that I'm working on at the moment. So this is an RCT uh, that myself and Chris Williams led uh, are leading. Um, so that's about 350 people with with back pain, and where um, we randomising people to the usual care or to get a package of 
um, uh, sort of physiotherapy and a dietitian with health coaching as well around some lifestyle health risks. Um, so we applied for funding 2016 in that, um, 2015, yeah. Got funding in 2016, um, lucky enough. Um, and we're about a third of the way through recruitment now in 2019. Um, it's gone well. But it, by any accounts, it, 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 it's gone quite well. You know, I imagine we'll be recruiting for another year or so. It's 12-month follow-up on the end of that. So 2020, 2021, um, you know, but there's a lot of work. You know, there's there's three PhD students who are working on this. There are one, two, three, four, five, six clinicians who are delivering it. We're, we're, we're working with a, a group who does the, the health coaching. Um, so... It, it, it's 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 an enormous amount of work and 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 collecting the data obviously that it, it's it's critically important that everyone does a follow up and that's all kept track of and all that sort of thing. Um, so that will be a period of six years or whatever it is. That's for a project which we actually got funded on pretty much pretty much straight away. Um, so that takes a really long time. Um, and 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 actually, um, so. so Focus. If, if we could spend more time focusing on those really big projects, uh, then I think we'd be better off. But in the meantime, as you said, we've got uh, we can't afford to have one or two papers every five years. Um, you know, we're you know rolling along at ten or twenty or thirty papers a year, and and so that that means you have to be constantly involved in a lot of stuff. The, the pressure to produce inevitably means that there's a lot of stuff which is uh, is perhaps not that important uh, in the scheme of things and and so that's you know that that's that's a major constraint I think well and I just wanted to add to that because I know that of course with that being in academia there is also yep. a pressure to get tenure and one of the aspects of it does involve this avenue as well is that correct yep yeah so I guess uh, the, 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 yes, there's that pressure to get tenure. Um, uh, I mean, I th that's not something which I'm necessarily looking towards or working towards or feel like that's you know that's not really what what I'm after. But by the same token, in order for me to do what I do, I need to be successful in getting funding to pay my salary, um, which means I'm essentially on um, a series of fixed contracts, um, which is the way it's been. For so far, and that's all worked fine, and that's good for me. Um, but yeah, the, the the point the points well made. The other thing is that there isn't there isn't a way to we aren't measured or isn't valued within the the sort of metrics which are important to us. The relationships that we make, which enable good research to be done. So so to 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 go the time going out and speaking to people to 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 build up the personal relationships which mean that they're going to be have some ownership and be involved and all that sort of stuff they take a long time and, and and not just the time that you put into them but a period of time to, to develop the trust that you need to do research particularly if it's if it's going to be research which is within a clinical context which is where where the sort of stuff we do sits it's a little bit different if you're doing experimental stuff in labs or 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 that sort of research but but for us developing those those personal relationships is critical it doesn't work without that right now you bring up a lot of good points there and i recognize that I, the answer is probably not known 100 percent to anyone in a universally agreement way but you know you mentioning these issues and kind of how these perverse incentives take place for research in that yep. kind of setting what are some ways that you think realistically that can start to be remedied to maybe even do it better so that more of those other research studies can be done more often, but still incentivizing? Like, what are your thoughts on just some ways that realistically um, that could be improved on? Yep. So, so I think, I think there's some, there's some, some things which are moving in a good direction now in the research landscape. One of them is, is the, um, is there's a, there's a shift to be, um, towards um, assessment of what they call impact. And, and so that's really a, an argument that you make that the research that, for example, I do changes something. It changes care. It changes the outcome of patients or, or whatever it is. And, and I think that's a really positive move um, as opposed to being judged by publishing 
papers which probably only other researchers read. Um, so, um, so, so, so I think that's a that's a really that's a really positive mood so move which 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 it ensures not only that the research is translatable or or, or generalizable into practice, but also it, that actually happens. So it's actually not measuring whether a research can be generalized, but does it? Um, and 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 I mean, there's there's all sorts of problems with how you measure that, and 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 it's a new thing, and and no one really knows how to do it, and blah blah blah, all that sort of thing. But I think that 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 concept is really important, and I think that's going to really, um, I think that's really going to move things in a in a, in a positive direction in terms of the research we do. The other thing which is happening is is um, research funding where traditionally has been basically just injected into universities um, is increasingly coming through um, uh, healthcare delivery units. So, so through the health department, for example. So, and again, I think this is a really positive move because that, that means that, you know, any time that, that the, the, the people who are delivering the care have a say in, in what's going on, then you, you just inevitably get more buy-in. And, and so I, I think that will, End up generating research, which is, which has a much higher chance of of, of being translated and implemented into practice. Well, yeah, and and speaking from a clinician point of view, one of the things that I'll also kind of do when I kind of am appraising an article is at the end I always ask myself, well, so what? What does mm -hmm. this mean? How does this apply yeah. to me? Like, what should I actually take away from it? And there are yeah. some that are really good, and then some I'm like, well, this doesn't really change. <laughs> A whole yeah, lot yeah. for me. It, it, I mean, some of it's still important because it looks at a different avenue to maybe answer or set some context for something else. Yeah. But I always have to think. I always read. I'm like, so what? What is this? Yeah, mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's. I mean, that's 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 got to be a critical part of 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 the appraisal of anyone who's who's a sort of consumer or user of research. Yeah. And, and probably and probably as sorry yeah probably as as researchers we've not done a particularly good job of 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 making sure that either that's clear or that we actually care about it yeah. um and 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 so and so that that's again i think these things will shift yeah no it's a fair point now this is a question that chad cook actually recommended that we ask all pretty well-known researchers so i'm going to ask right. it for him okay. what is your biggest regret as a researcher to be honest uh, Things are going pretty well for me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I've, 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 I have an amazing job. I love my job. You know, I get, to, as I said, I get to ask questions for a living, and, and I work with amazing people. I have a lot of flexibility to to, to follow the paths that I'm interested in. I think are, are valuable. Perhaps not a regret, but but something which I think is just starting to to gather momentum now, um, uh, which which. Perhaps I wish I had have got gotten on to a bit earlier, and maybe it's just because I'm a bit slow. But um, it, it's really there's this idea of embedded research. So it, it's 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 whereby um, people like myself with with you know skills in terms of skills in terms of of, of research um, sit within a health delivery context. And offer those skills to improve patient care, as opposed to sitting in a university and coming up with ideas to ask questions. So, so actually, the the, the it, it involves people like myself changing the idea of what we do, and and really changing that idea from well, we're the ones who ask the questions, design the studies, and do the and and produce and blah blah blah, to being well, well, actually, we're technicians or tools that could sit within care delivery environment and offer those tools to to improve care um, and, and and we can do that by by using the sorts of things that we know about and we understand about collecting data and we understand about asking you know formalizing questions and we understand about manipulating variables and and judge and evaluating things and all that sort of stuff and so I, I think that in in terms of um, I think the vision of that's pretty exciting um, and and I think and I think if that's what clinical research could become I think that'd be amazing and I, and I think that's where that's where real impact could happen you know if if you know it, I talked previously about the the idea of you know evidence and research methods framing practice and that sort of stuff if research was actually going on through the you know if, if research was part of practice and but it was it was it was part of practice 
in order with with the goal of improving the quality of care and quality of, of, of service delivery um you know i think that would be the ideal ideal way to to go i mean at the moment we have there's a well recognized um sort of division between researchers and clinicians and so we have to find a way of 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 um of breaking that down because it, it's it's it, it has essentially as as i see it anyway both parties have a mutual dependence so so if, if for example physiotherapists want to say we're a we're a profession which is is based in science then there has to be science which is relevant to the to the the sort of um, things that physiotherapists do, and the physiotherapists themselves have to engage with that science. As clinical researchers, if if um, there's to be any point to what I do, it has to be translated into care. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's just a sort of an exercise in futility. So, so at the way I see it, there is this real mutual dependence between clinicians and researchers and clinical researchers. And and so what we have to find, and, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure we've, we've gone, we've gone far enough in trying to work out how we break down this barrier. And it sounds like based on the things that you had said earlier that are happening as kind of a change, I mean, I think that that's obviously kind of a step in the right direction. And I think there's enough of a well-known I think realization of this issue, and I think it's just a matter of problem solving to find what's the best way to do it realistically for everyone. And and I don't know the answer. And I don't know the answer to that. And I think we're just trying to figure out what that is. Um, yep. But I, hopefully that will come to more fruition. But you know, Steve, I got to ask you our final question here. And I know you've yep. talked a lot about research here, so yep. I want to see if you can say something that you haven't said already. So right. for this question, we ask this at the end of every episode, and it is. Yep. If you could change one aspect of healthcare education, whether that be yeah. physiotherapy or other healthcare provider related, which yep. aspect would you change and how would you change it? What I would like to see would be that um, healthcare professionals are trained to think like scientists. And so and so so what that means to me anyway is that means that all the information that comes to us runs through this process of appraisal and 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 then at the end of that appraisal you come out with some idea of how confident you are that that's true or not um so but we tend to not we apply that in a sort of formal way to research so we have tools for doing that we have bias assessment and all this sort of stuff we don't necessarily do that with all the other information that we have you know we have information from what we learned in in school we have information from what we read on the internet we have information from you know the stuff that comes on twitter or you know conversations we have we have information from what we've you know what our previous experience etc etc and 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 so i think i think what would be really beneficial helpful would be if if we were trained to to to, to sort of apply that lens to all the information that we have and then so then to me anyway then the whole business of incorporating research into that is 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 simple and intuitive because it's no different that 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 research study body of studies whatever it is is just a piece of information it's just another piece of information that you run through the same filter fact is we have a you know we have a, a formalized structure for that we don't have a formalized structure but we can still run through stuff the same field we can ask ourselves some questions and what do i believe this where's this coming from who's saying it um you know on what basis do i think it's true or not true how much confidence do i have and how much does it apply to this situation all those questions are exactly the same as 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 the process for for understanding research um so i guess that it, it's a it's sort of a it, uh, in terms of education, it's sort of, I guess, a framework for for understanding whatever it is that we, um, whatever information is in front of it. So, I guess, yeah, I, don't, I kind of conceptualize it as thinking like a scientist, but I don't know. Maybe that's not the best way. But no, I mean that makes sense. I mean, really trying to develop good critical thinking, critical appraising skills. Because I forgot who said this. Was it? I think it was Stephen Hawking. Was he the one who did the quote that says, uh, "We don't suffer from lack of knowledge. The biggest thing is the illusion of knowledge." Yeah, so, yeah. It was, it was something <laughs> like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was something like that. But it's just like, but it's a good point of how how sure are we? How sure are we about what we know? Yeah, yeah. And, 
and that's a really big. But yeah. I think I think that's a very interesting answer because I don't think I've ever heard that specific answer from before. So that's why I love getting right. different perspectives on this. Cool. <laughs> well, Steve, I, I appreciate your time, especially with everything, and thank you for again what you guys do. I hope the research continues to go well. Hope some awesome data comes from it, and thanks thank for you. spending the time to chat. Um, if someone's got a question or they want to kind of learn a little bit more, where would you recommend that they either look online or reach out to either ask a question or even learn a little bit more about this? Yeah, you can, you can find me on Twitter at stevecamper1. Um, you can send me an email at steve.camper at sydney.edu.au. Um, uh, Chris Williams and I have a website which is a little bit un under construction, but it's getting there. Um, called the Center for Pain, Health and Lifestyle. So that's, I guess, a, a sort of an umbrella term that uh, organization that we've we've sort of set up, which is really just about providing an an, an, an identity for the, the sort of program of work that we're doing, which is really trying to understand where pain fits in, in sort of broader ideas of health generally. So you can have a look at that. And yeah, I'm pretty easy to, it's pretty easy to find my email address. Just put me in Google and you'll find me. Um, and yeah, I'm always happy to, to yeah, take questions, but, but also if there's any, any of my work that you want access to and you don't have access, please send me an email. I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to send you PDFs of stuff. Well, perfect, Steve. Again, thanks so much for that. And thank you for all that you do. Keep up the great work and thanks for coming on this evening, man. It's always a pleasure. Bye. My pleasure, Brandon. Thank you very much. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today. And we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.